Good evening and welcome to Yerba Buena Center of the Arts. And welcome to the forum. My name is Charles Ward and I'm YBCA's Senior Director of Development. We're delighted to have you all here to help us launch this new quarterly series of conversations with some of the leading artists, activists, and thought leaders in the country today. As much as we here at YBCA are interested in the art that we present, we are as interested in the ideas behind that art and the way that art impacts and it enriches our lives. And so as much as we're known for our location being near the intersections of Third and Mission and Howard Streets, we also consider the work that we present to be at the intersection of art and ideas. And that's what this series is about. Before I go any further, I want to thank our sponsors for this evening's program. Michael D. Communications, I think Michael's there. Also, the African American Employees Network, and David Spencer is here and is going to say hello. Thank you, Charles. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the African American Employee Network, uh, I'd like to just say welcome to uh, this evening. Thank you, Charles, for those eloquent words, for an amazing night, uh, and welcoming an amazing woman, uh, Kamala Harris. I want to thank uh, Michael D., also D. Lachu, and Nicole Felix uh, as co-founders of the African American Employee Network, and just welcoming all of you here. Uh, I'd like to say with Kamala, first met her during her first campaign, which they said she wouldn't win. They said it couldn't be done, and we were just chatting about that upstairs, and look at her now. So we just like to say welcome and thank you. Thank you, David. I'd also like to thank the following organizations who have supported this program through their promotional efforts. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Black Women Lawyers Association of Northern California, Black Women Organized for Political Action, Charles Houston Bar Association, Howard University Alumni Club, Coalition, <laughs> Coalition of 100 I call it 1,000 black women, both the San Francisco and Oakland chapters, a coalition of black professional organizations, Esther Lena Vineyards, and Ida L. Jackson Education and Housing Foundation. Now I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about YBCA and who we are. We are both a place and a nonprofits organization nonprofit arts organization. As a place, we think of ourselves as a community resource. We rent our performance spaces for other local uh, presenting arts organizations such as San Francisco Performances, SF Jazz, ODC, Lines Ballet, who's in the theater next door, and others. We're also a rental facility for companies such as Apple, Salesforce, Google, and Hewlett Packard. The introduction to the world of the iPhone and the iPad were made from the stage in our theater. And the first public hands-on demonstration of both devices took place in this room. As an organization, we are a multidisciplinary contemporary arts presenter with programs in the performing, visual, and film arts. The artists that we feature are from around the Bay Area and around the world. And they're doing the most interesting, cutting edge, and provocative work that you will find anywhere. Currently in our galleries, we have a portion of a shared exhibit with SF MoMA of the work of LA-based artist Mark Bradford. And next week in this space, we'll be presenting internationally renowned choreographer David Zambrano and his new work, Soul Project. Please check the flyer that was left on your seat for dates and times. Also, the galleries will be open at the end of this event, so I invite you to visit the Mark Bradford exhibit before you leave. 
Our support comes from a combination of grants and individual contributions and memberships. We hope that as you learn more about our programs, that you will come again soon and often. Now please take a moment to turn off your cell phones and any type of electronic device. In case of an emergency, please take a moment to look around you and find the nearest available exit. Our moderator is an author, journalist, blogger, and public intellectual. If you've not read her work, then perhaps you've seen her or heard her on CNN, MSNBC, or National Public Radio. She's currently a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Farai Chidea. Our other guest really does not need an introduction. She's a Bay Area native. She's the former San Francisco District Attorney. And she's the current California State Attorney General. Please welcome Kamala Harris. I just want to really thank the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and Charles Ward for championing this kind of event where we can get together and have a relaxed but substantive conversation about things that are going on today. And I'm so delighted to be with you as the Attorney General of the State of California. It's, and I'm honored to talk with you. <laughs> so this. I'm going to range around a little bit, but I want to start with recent events. Okay. Um, in the Sacramento Bee today, there was an article about pending legislation that, that, you know, that you're championing and a hearing that was postponed by Assemblyman Ang. Uh -huh. um, and there are people, of course, all across California who've been dealing with the housing and foreclosure and mortgage crisis. What are you trying to do and what, and what has gotten stuck and how do you propose to unstick it? <laughs> as forcefully as possible. <laughs> um, so the context of is, uh, there are a number of issues. Uh, one, California was probably the hardest hit state in the country uh, as a result of what initially was a, a boom around the housing market and then quickly became a bust. Um, in fact, California at one time last year had nine of the top ten cities hardest hit. Uh, we have been competing with Nevada for number one hardest hit. Um, Las Vegas or Stockton, California. And, um, and so it's a huge issue that has impacted a lot of real people and a lot of Californians. So it's an issue that, that, that I focused on even when I was DA and we created a mortgage fraud uh, team when I was DA and then as Attorney General in the first months we created a mortgage fraud strike force to address corporate fraud, consumer fraud and criminal cases. Uh, in addition, we were part of what is called a multi-state, which was a, a, it's a term of art that describes multiple attorneys general coming together around a common focus. And in this case, it was the robo-signing investigations, which were, uh, which showed that, that the top five banking institutions were part of a process that would just rubber stamp foreclosures without doing the due diligence that is, is, is required and should be required before you take somebody's house. So we were part of that process. It, it's been well documented that uh, they were offering California somewhere between two and four billion. I thought that was crumbs on the table, so I pulled California out of the conversation. Um, and then when we were able to get what we finally got, um, we, we, we accepted that after a lot of heavy negotiations, <laughs> um, which is that we brought California 18 billion instead. And, um, and so that was nice. Yeah. And so that was good. But it was a part of it. And so then another part of it has been that, you know, so that's the five banks, that's the five top banks. But part of has, the, the focus for me has also been the fact that Freddie and Fannie own 62% of California mortgages. And they were not at the table for that discussion. 
And so, I, I, and then I have publicly called on this fellow DeMarco who runs Freddie and Fannie that if he doesn't understand that principal reductions are in the best interest of these homeowners and allowing them to keep their homes and the economy, that the man should step aside because he clearly doesn't understand what is in the best interest of these homeowners on that, on that issue. Um, but we also, just to emphasize the point, have um, sued Freddie and Fannie. And so that was another piece of <laughs> And then the, the other piece the of it, <laughs> the <laughs> carrot and the stick. And so the, the other piece of this broad focus has been that there, are, um, there are, are rules that are going to be fixed as a result of the national settlement, but it's a t temporary fix. It's for three years. And what we are proposing is that we should permanently fix what we know are flaws in the system. And um, only because homeowners and all of us should expect that the rules will be fair for everyone and that they will be transparent. So I have proposed in Sacramento what we are calling the Homeowner Bill of Rights, the California Homeowner Bill of Rights, and it's six bills. And, um, and the bills were, heard, were scheduled to be heard for the first time this week um, on Monday in the Assembly Banking Committee. And uh, the two bills in particular that were to be heard there uh, deal with what apparently have turned out to be the most contentious issues in terms of the banking lobby. And in particular, one of the bills would require, and again, they're both really common sense approaches, one would require that we would end the process, we would, we would, we would um, fix the process of dual track, the process where someone is in the process of being foreclosed upon, they're also trying to modify their loan so they can stay in their home. So they're paying that modified payment, and then you know what happens under the current system. While they're in the process of playing by the rules, paying that modified loan, they're foreclosed upon. Well, that's not fair. And I've held hearings up and down the state, often and mostly without press, as a matter of fact, to talk with these homeowners, and this is the story I hear countless times. So it would end that. It would say that the servicing institution may not foreclose upon that homeowner if they are in the process of doing what the rules require. The second bill would deal with this. Countless stories. Homeowner in the process of foreclosure calling the bank. If they get someone on the phone, that person says, I don't know your case, I'm not familiar with it, and we don't have your paperwork. So this homeowner, you know, because remember, we're talking about not a real estate transaction for these homeowners. We're talking about their home, the place where they're raising their babies, the place where they have invested all that is important about living a productive life and in believing in the American dream. You know, and I try to remember people, I remind them when they're, when they're mischaracterizing who the homeowners are. I, I've been saying to them, and you'll appreciate this, have you ever known somebody who was proud of their lawn? Yeah. Because yeah. that's who I'm talking about. People who are proud that they are invested in their community. They are mm -hmm. proud of their lawn. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the, the second bill would simply say, instead of having them have to call and each time talk to somebody different who doesn't have their paperwork, the servicers should be required to designate a single point of contact for that homeowner. And, um, and so, well, thank you. And so... Y'all need to come up to Sacramento with me, those of you who are <laughs> clapping, because apparently not everyone is clapping at the notion. <laughs> well, not everyone is clapping, and some people are putting a lot of money into fighting this legislation. Yeah. And, and although these two issues may seem unrelated, when I was reading about the amount of money that's going into lobbying, basically on behalf of not changing the rules mm -hmm. affecting lenders, I also thought about the, the money that went into the Stand Your Ground laws and huh. the Trayvon Martin case and, and just the influence of lobbying on uh, creating law and hmm. sort of perpetuating the status quo either way or the other. How do you as Attorney General deal with the inevitable mm -hmm. fact that money is, has a seat at the table of power? You know, it's, it, it is a reality. Um, there are a lot of lobbyists. Um, by the way, I would suggest to you that, that it's in some, for some situations, the only place that these termed out legislators can go and we need to deal with term limits and, and, and give them an opportunity to develop a career out of subject matter in, <laughs> in, in the legislature. Um, but it is a reality and, and, and so it is something that we must deal with. Uh, part of 
how I believe we can deal with it is just reminding people that on this issue in particular, it should not be the subject of any conversation that is, frankly, an intellectual conversation or a conversation about ideology. This is just practical. I have met people up and down this state. I have met people who have an R or a D next to their name. It has touched every socioeconomic group, every ethnic and racial group, up and down the state. This is an issue that has not discriminated among people or counties. And, and for that reason, I am, I am optimistic, in spite of what happened on Monday, that these legislators can be convinced to do the right thing. Um, because there is, it, it, this is just about common sense uh, corrections to broken systems. And let's remember that if this were so extreme, the banks wouldn't have agreed to most of this in the first place as in, in connection with the settlement. But, but too often I think we find, and we've discussed it many times, many of us, when it relates to criminal justice policy or, or other issues, too often false choices are presented. And in this situation, the false choice is that fixing some of the rules is over-regulation of an industry or, or meant to even regulate the industry at all. It is not. It's meant to just fix some simple rules. And I am not giving up on this. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it is absolutely the right thing to do. And I believe that we can convince the folks that need to be convinced um, that it is the right thing to do. And um, to the extent that we need to keep telling the stories, I think that that helps. And we will continue to do that. But, but um, this is, this is very, very important, and it could be a game changer in California around what working people who are playing by the rules deserve to have in terms of fair and transparent rules. I want to, before I continue with some of your current work, I want to back up a little bit. And I was, you know, as I was doing some research before we sat down. Of course, I've been following your career for years and years, but I saw a video of you speaking to students at Hamil the Hamilton School. Oh. And, uh, you know, a bunch of little girls. Uh -huh. and, and one of the first things you said to them was, I was five once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, I had to get their attention. Exactly. So, <laughs> so who were you at five years old? Who were you at five years oh, old? What so were you funny. like? Were you litigating against uh, your mother when you didn't get a cookie in the afternoon? Or <laughs> you know, I I had I, I've been very blessed and very fortunate. I had an incredible childhood. Um, surrounded by, I mean, I was raised by an incredible mother who was ferocious and strong and, and, a, and an extended family and in an environment that was, you know, around the civil rights era. And, I, you know, I grew up hearing songs that said, be proud and it's a sunshiny day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and so it was in that environment that I, I was raised and, 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 and that I thrived. I, and, and I think many of us growing up at that time did. And, um, and it, was, it was at a time where we were encouraged to you know, run as fast as you can run. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we would be, you know, everybody around us in, in my family and extended family, they were always debating about you know, what was happening at the time in terms of politics and, and policy and injustice. And we as children were absolutely encouraged to join the conversation. We were not allowed to engage in baby talk. Mm. And we would be asked to defend whatever it is that we said. Mm -hmm. But we were absolutely encouraged to be part of that conversation. And I think that's, my sister and I, Maya, have talked about that. That, that probably is why she and I both ended up being lawyers. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and I had a similar thing in my family, uh -huh. and that's probably why I ended up being right. a reporter, you know? Right. Just like jump into the conversation. And it gives you a certain confidence. Yeah. To know, you know, that, I've, I've also thought about it from this perspective, and I'm sure you had the same experience. One of the things that I think um, happened was that my mother and, and, and our extended family somehow convinced us kids and, and convinced me that, that I was special. Now, I, I was not special, but somebody had me believing I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And there is something about that. It's an incredible mm -hmm. gift. And it's, and it's, it's more than meets the eye, because it's not your superior. Right. 
You know, part of that means, so when you're in that situation where you're doing what you shouldn't be doing, you should know better, yeah. right? And, and that was part of what I think was also at play as I, as I reflect on my childhood. So, so your sister is quite a powerful yes, woman in the is. world yes, of nonprofits uh -huh. at the Ford Foundation. Yes, she's the, the vice president of the Ford Foundation. She is in charge. There are three divisions of the Ford Foundation, and Maya Harris is in charge of the largest of those three divisions, my sister. And... <laughs> <laughs> And as we speak, I was just on the phone with her earlier. She's got a big deadline tomorrow. She's, you know, and she flies off to Brazil where she's got projects in the favelas and she's got mm -hmm. some projects in, in various African countries and Asian countries. And she is doing God's work. It's, it's so fabulous. It's really good work. So, so one of the, the many things uh, about your, your family and childhood is that it is an intercultural family where you are a black woman who also has South Asian mm -hmm. heritage. And, and right now, you know, we've, we've sort of evolved into a country that has a broader understanding of intercultural and multiracial identity. Kinda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least on the surface, <laughs> yes. Agreed. Agreed. Um, how... How did, how was the world of race and ethnicity explained to you as you were growing up? And mm -hmm. how do you think it's different now? Because your point is absolutely correct. It's like, well, yeah. I mean, one of the things is, is also I've, for studying race and ethnicity, I've traveled all across the country um, and done tons of interviews with people. And I don't think it's even just generational. It's like you can go to parts of America that are in the 1850s and parts that are 10 years in the future yeah. and everything in between, you know, so. So first, and I know you know this, um, the subject of race is a very complicated subject first. Yeah. and not something that can be appropriately and properly discussed in a short time, period of time. Um, and I'll just throw out a couple of points to that, to that end. Um, I was born in Oakland, California. I grew up <laughs> proud of it too. <laughs> and um, I was, and I, and I also will say, I don't know what the audience react, don't react to the next point, but, and I'm not that old, but, <laughs> but I, was, I, was, I was part of the second class to integrate Berkeley Public Schools. Really? Hmm. Now, Brown v. Board of Education, you all remember, and I was not born when it was decided, was decided in 1954. One of the most, to your point about the diversity of this country, mm -hmm. one of the most liberal places in the country, Berkeley, California, did not implement Brown v. Board of Education, Board of Education until the 1970s. Okay? So let's throw that out there. Let's throw out the whole point about, you know, the one-eighth rule, right, Octoroon, that forever in this country, if you had one-eighth black blood, you were not a whole human being, right? It's a complicated subject. So I will just make a very quick statement about how I was raised. I was raised by a proud Indian mother as a proud African-American woman. That's how I was raised, because mm -hmm. my mother was acutely aware of the environment in which she gave birth to and was raising her children. I am proud of my Indian culture and heritage and know probably as much, if not more, about the history than a child who was born to two Indian parents, you know, in India. But it's a complicated subject. Oh, absolutely. And, um, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's an, that's an excellent place to leave it. I actually, a couple years ago, was in Tamil Nadu, which I understand yes. is where your mother, yes. mother's family is from. Right. And, and uh, India itself has a million shades, a million ethnicities, right. a million, you know, I mean, it's a very interesting place to even, you know, in, in and of itself, think about the impact of race, ethnicity, and identity. Oh yeah, I mean, even, you know, the, um, I mean, and we used to go back, my, grand, my grandfather, I was just talking to somebody today about this, 
I mean, my grandfather, my mother's father, was probably one of my first favorite people on earth. Um, and he was one of the original freedom fighters in India. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we used to, and he would, sp- he would let me, I was the firstborn grandchild, you know, he would let me go on walks with him and he would talk about the importance of, of democracy and, 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 you know, getting rid of corrupt government and honest government and representative government. And, and he actually went on to live for a long time, he and my grandmother, in Lusaka when oh, yeah. Zambia gained independence mm-hmm. and to, to do all that. So anyway, it's, it's a long oh, conversation. Yeah. 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 Maybe, <laughs> maybe one day when you have uh, stopped litigating and, and, tr- um, and ruling the world, you can do a memoir that includes all oh, of this Lord, stuff. Oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> well, one of the other things that, that this conversation about childhood has really brought up mm-hmm. to me is uh, the, the issue of educational inequality, yeah. which I think is part of the American story and also part of the Californian story. And, and right now, mm-hmm. California's public education institutions, mm-hmm. no matter where on the spectrum, are going through a really tough time. Right. How do you process that and how do you see it, for example, with you know, what some, some people call the, uh, you know, the preschool to prison pipeline, et cetera? Right. Um, I think about it all the time. And um, y- y- right now, to your point, of all African American and Latino ninth graders in California, only half, less than half will graduate high school. And if you walk into a jail or an emergency room or even a county morgue among a certain population, especially who are young men, you will see those numbers reflected. So it's an awful reality. And to your point in terms of how you, you, you phrase the question, I put that in context of also back to my childhood. My first grade teacher, many people have heard the story, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Frances Wilson, God rest her soul, attended my law school graduation. Oh, yes, she that's did. wonderful. Yes, she did. And, and so, you know, it, it's a shame, right, what has happened with public education in the state of California in particular. Because we once had a model public education and, and, and we now are close to being the worst in the country. And, you know, I frankly think that part of the issue there is that we as a society in general um, need to confront the fact that we, we, we pretend to care about education. But, you know, and we say we do, but, but not so much the education of other people's children. And we need to deal with that. Yeah. We need to deal with that, right? And so, and that's about realizing that, you know, for all of the obvious reasons, right? It's about everything that has to do with workforce development, about completing in a global economy, and just about, you know, what should be the, the promise of a, of a civil society. And, um, and so it, it troubles me, and I think about it a lot. Many people here who are San Franciscans know that when I was DA of San Francisco, I started a whole initiative around elementary school truancy. It is still very much in my focus as an issue, mm-hmm. and, and I've got a couple of my special assistant attorney generals here actually tonight, one of whom has it in his portfolio to, to focus on that. I, I think, in fact, of the many big issues in the world, if you break them down into their discrete parts, there is one, it's, it's almost an obsession of mine, that if you fix it, you will fix so many bigger issues, and that is the issue of elementary school truancy. Mm-hmm. I really do believe that. And I believe that because I did the, the work of seeing who the homicide victims were in San Francisco who were under the age of 25, and 94% of them were high school dropouts. And then I went over to the school district and I asked, who are the chronically and habitually truant public school students? 40% were elementary school students. And really? when you look closer at who the elementary school students are, you would see repeated cases of those children missing 40, 50, 60 days of a 180-day school year. Now, who is that child going to end up being? Yeah. And the, the reality of society is such that of the many things that are an urgent issue for us, none of you walked in here tonight thinking, i got to deal with elementary school truancy. <laughs> right? But when you think about it in terms of how fixable it could generally be, as opposed to what on, and, 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 and cost-effective, as opposed to what we're dealing with in social services systems, what we're dealing with in criminal justice systems, workforce development issues. Um, I, I think that is an issue that we all should be shocked about and saying, 
those children need to be in school. We can debate all day long the quality of the education they get when they're in school, but they're getting no education if they're not in school. Right? Yeah. So, Marion Wright Edelman of the mm -hmm. Children's Defense Fund, yeah. uh, you know, of course, is, is a tireless champion and, and yeah. brings up the salient yeah. fact that kids can't vote and mm -hmm. right. a lot of people aren't willing to vote on behalf mm -hmm. of kids. So in the many different roles that you have played um, intervening in the, the criminal justice system but also dealing with the political system, mm -hmm. not just with, with kids, not just with prisons and criminal justice, but in general, yeah. how, how should citizens think about mm -hmm. their role and the kind of account, like the, thinking about what your grandfather talked about, mm -hmm. how, you know, creating good government. Yeah. A lot of people are discouraged, you know? What, what do you say to people who are discouraged by the state of their local, federal, state governments and how to keep up the faith and engage? You have, it, it's really important to participate. Uh, you know, and in that way, you know, so the, I guess the obvious point is, is also don't give up. At the point that we all give up, you know, then we're all just sitting in our, in our homes with our doors closed and, and mad. <laughs> Who has time to be mad? Yeah. <laughs> Let's get out and, and put that into something, but participate. I mean, I would encourage everyone here, whether your children are young or grown or you don't have children, go to school board meetings. Like, find out when the school board is meeting and go and sit in those from time to time. And weigh, weigh in. Um, you know, consider running for some position in your community and it, or, or putting your name in to, to be appointed to a commission. Um, get involved with your local nonprofit. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening here at Yerba Buena is so incredible in terms of what they host that, that is directly connected with the community. Um, there are so many nonprofits that could use the benefit of, of someone who has wherewithal and will and time and skills. Um, but you can't give up. It's just there's too much to be done. And, and, and this is one of the, 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 I guess, the good fortunes that I've had in my career is that I've actually seen how you can make a difference. It can be a frustrating process to get there, but you can make a difference. What was the moment that you had in your early political career, if there was one, mm -hmm. there may not have been, where you said, I don't know if this is worth it. And how did you get past that? <laughs> um, I had that experience. You know what's coming? I, I, nothing comes to mind. I mean, I've had many moments that were very challenging and difficult, to be sure. Mm -hmm. And um, many moments where, you know, I, um, I wasn't sure how it was all going to turn out. And, um, and so that's, that's for sure. I'll tell you one of the first moments that I actually wondered, like, what, which way is this going to go, is in my race for attorney general, when Carl Rove and them guys <laughs> pulled together that $1.6 million independent expenditure against me and did a hit against us in a down ticket race in Los Angeles. That was a moment where I was like, oof, I used a different word. And I... <laughs> Like, oh my goodness, yeah. are we going to get, this hurts, are we going to get through this? Yeah. That was one and of those moments, most, and we did, and we did with a lot of work and a lot of faith. I never, I never knew, I, I, I always believed we could win, I never knew we would, I always knew we could, and that, I guess that gets back to the point I was making earlier about just don't give up. And, and what... Uh, what is the most unexpected part of your role as Attorney General mm -hmm. of this enormous country-sized state? Yeah, you hit it on the head with that emphasis. It's the part about the job that I had not fully thought out, and I guess many of us know that we shouldn't fully think out certain things ever because otherwise we'll never do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I had not thought about that piece of it. I am sometimes on six planes a week. Ugh. Seriously, like wow. my, the TSA guys are my friends, you know, <laughs> like, you know, they see me coming and going, how was yesterday? It went well. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, that part I had not, I had not really, that can be a, a bit um, 
taxing, but, but, but it's also to some extent self-imposed because especially my first year, I really wanted to, to go out. And, and, and so one of my first trips, for example, was to Imperial County, um, which is down at the border with Mexico. El Centro, which is a city in Imperial County, is probably the poorest city in the country. You know, I wanted to go meet with folks there. I don't know them. I don't know that yeah. community. And I, and I feel that it, maybe it's the trial lawyer in me. You've got to go to the scene. You've got to yeah. feel and talk with people where they are. You can't expect them to come knocking at your door. But you've got to go. Because if you're going to be relevant at all when you're making these decisions, you, you've got to have them in mind visually, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went, for example, during that trip to also see the, the tunnels coming up through Calexico. So on the California side, it's called Calexico. On the Mexican side, it's called Mexicali. And there are these tunnels. And I saw photographs of some tunnels that had walls as smooth as any wall in your house, lined with lighting and air conditioning, <laughs> which made the obvious point. This is about a big business where people are making a lot of money profiting off the trafficking of guns, drugs, and human beings. And heard stories from some of these big guys who, who manned the tunnels with tears in their eyes about children as young as five being trafficked through those tunnels, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's it. The travel is, it can be a bit daunting, but it is so important. And, I'm, and, and it's, it's part of it, as, as they said in The Godfather, you know, this is the, the life you have chosen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that we got a Godfather reference in there. <laughs> love it, love it. And you, it, I won't ask whose who's bed you put a horse's head on. Oh in yeah, no, no. <laughs> not having that conversation. <laughs> I, uh, during part of my reporting in, in the past couple years, um, I went to Nogales uh, in Arizona, which is next to Nogales, Mexico, also has yeah, the, right. the tunnels mainly right. used for drug running. Mm -hmm. um, obviously in California, immigration and how yeah. to deal with both legal and undocumented immigration yeah. has been a huge issue in terms of public opinion, in terms of education funding, in terms of enforcement. Mm -hmm. How do you view mm -hmm. what needs to happen in California? Well, I think about California in the context of what needs to happen nationally, and we need to have reform of our immigration laws. There's no question. And, um, and so then when I think about what happens in California, I think about what happens in, in Arizona, for example, which is why um, I filed a, 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 a brief before the Supreme Court saying that that ridiculous law in Arizona should be ruled unconstitutional. Um, and, 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 but, and, and I call it ridiculous because from, for many reasons, which include, has, have everything to do with my, my career, my, my entire adult life being a career prosecutor. It has been my experience over and over again that when you, um, that, that with immigrant victims, one of the best tools in the tool belt of the predator of that victim is to convince the victim that if you report the crime, it is you that will be treated as the criminal. Mm -hmm. And so what we want, and, and, and let's also put it in the context of another point, which is I think that you know, for, for, for all that is good and bad, we have the best system of democracy in this country. And included in that is an intentional design that we will have local, state, and federal jurisdictions which have different responsibilities. And for law enforcement, that is also true. And for local law enforcement, it is not their responsibility to enforce immigration laws so that that victim can know that she can go to that police officer and wave him down and say, I am the victim of a crime without fear that she will be deported. Because anybody who commits a crime against one human being and gets away with it is going to be empowered to think they can do it against someone else. Mm. So let's not think it's just her problem. It'll be the community problem in terms of public safety. And, and that's where I come from on this issue. When you look at uh, America right now dealing with, you know, there, again, we've been talking about immigration, education, so many different issues. Mm -hmm. There's one issue that 
comes to the fore in all of them, which is resources. Mm -hmm. And on the federal level, right. there's a huge debate over, uh, you know, do we pay down our debt? Do we spend? Do we do both? Do we, you know, revert the tax breaks of the Bush era? You know, California has Prop 13, which has been yeah. dictating some of the revenue issues here. Right. How do you think about money in terms of what what we need to spend in order to function on a state level or a federal level? And, and I mean, it's, uh, this may not even be an issue that, that you mm -hmm. end up talking about a lot in mm -hmm. your role, but it must be one you think about. All the time. Um, as do any of us, right? So the, the point is this. We all have various responsibilities and, and, and desires in terms of what we can do, um, but we have limited resources. And so we need to always, all of us, be it someone who, like me, I'm, I have an office that has a, a roughly $800 million budget. Be it that or the, my, my, my household budget, we constantly, all of us, must look at the distribution of resources and determine whether they are, 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 it's a smart distribution of resources, understanding we don't have unlimited resources. And in difficult economic times, much more so. And, and so that forces also a lot of us to do what I reluctantly but fully embrace, which is the triage. Just accept the fact that there are so many things that are important, but I'm not going to be able to get to everything because I don't have unlimited resources. You know, it's like I, I, I'd say to my staff, we cannot do everything. Let's focus on some things, do them well, not to the exclusion of the importance of other things. So, but in, the, um, in, in this economic climate for California, it's very difficult. And I, and I frankly praise and do not envy the governor in terms of the job that he must do dealing with what last year was an over $20 billion deficit and making difficult choices about what you do when it comes to critical services. That being said, I do also believe that in the interest of that and many other things, government has got to embrace innovation, and it does not. It, it, we are so, in many ways, stuck in a position where we define our success based on some blind adherence to tradition. Instead of understanding and thinking about things as they can be unburdened in our mind by things as they've always been. And, and that means about looking at systems, right? And, and revising those systems in a way that they can be more efficient. Looking at, I've talked about it countless times, about the criminal justice system, for example, where we're spending billions of dollars a year. And, and, and assessing our system in a way that it does what the private sector has done so well, which is, use this word, what's the return on our investment? Mm. And for these many dollars that we're putting into it and we have these revolving doors, is this the smartest way to use that money? Um, I think that there needs to be more efficiency in government around the adoption of technology. We are so apt, obsolete, it's awful. Yeah. And here we are, California, our, you know, our first cousin of Silicon Valley that created the technology that changes the world. And, you, you know, some police departments up and down the state still don't have email, you know. So, yeah, I mean, this is the reality. I mean, you all remember the story I used to tell over and over again when I was elected DA of San Francisco in 2004. Two-thirds of my lawyers did not have email. Really? San Francisco. <laughs> you know, so this is, when you pull back that curtain on the way government works, it's a scary sight sometimes. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of like, when, remember in The Wizard of Oz when they pulled back yeah. the curtain and that little guy was there running everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was just talking to someone in the federal government who was, who was saying that one of the reasons he felt that they were so behind was the procurement process, which is completely different from the tech process. Like in the tech mm -hmm. process, it's like, um, I need a website. Okay, what do you need? I need this. Can you get it done in three weeks? Sure. You know, that does not work. Well, but, and then it, you raise another point, which I should just mention, because it is also an area of focus, which is for me, um, which is looking at fraud. Yeah. Yeah. And dealing with that, because that costs taxpayers a lot of money. And, um, and so, you know, within my responsibilities as Attorney General, that is um, an area of focus for me also. Absolutely. Fraud against the state. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can go back a, a little bit. I'm jumping around your life and career, and, and all of it is just fascinating and wonderful. Um, 
to why you decided to be a prosecutor mm -hmm. and deal with, you know, you obviously have strong feelings about what uh, justice is and what an ethical society is and civil mm -hmm. society. Why was it important to you to be on the side of the law that you, that you are in the, in the area of the law that, that you were? Because, you know, I believe, you know, I, I say often I, I was inspired by Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and Constance Baker Motley and, and those great lawyers who understood the power of being a lawyer to, 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 to ensure that justice occurs and that equality occurs. And included in that is giving a voice to the voiceless. And when you are talking about a victim of crime, you are talking about some of the most voiceless and vulnerable among us. And that's why I wanted to do that job. And do it in a way that gives those individuals a voice, gives them safety, obviously, but also gives them dignity. And, um, and so that's why I decided I wanted to be a prosecutor. Well, I'm not sure whether or not we are going to questions. I was awaiting a potential audio cue, but uh, yes. That, so, so and, we, and that's called Charles Ward. Okay, yeah, I don't. <laughs> Charles Ward, standing in the shadows, waiting for your questions. So, so Charles, um, I will leave it up to you. We'll probably only be able to take three questions. And, and here's, here's the, uh, the man with the power, the woman with the power. And let's see. Yes. Hi, Kamala Robin Brasser. Hi, uh, hi nice there. to see you again today. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out, I, I taught middle school here in San Francisco for 37 years, and we spend more money on keeping a person in prison than we do to educate a child in this state. We spend about seven, $8,000 per pupil. We can spend 60, 70, $80,000 to keep one person in prison, and I think that is outrageous. Thank you for that question. <laughs> 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 I've known her for years. Yeah. Hey, she's a real leader. And I thank you for that. I was giving you a hard time. Uh, and a real supportive friend. Thank you. Okay. I, I think we yep, got a question right there. Good evening, ladies. My name is Gail Todd. I have a question about elementary truancy. It kind mm -hmm. of breaks your heart to hear about that. Mm -hmm. But does your, you and your team have a plan to hold these parents mm -hmm. accountable for these little babies? Yeah, so Gail, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, I, I, I strongly feel, you know, I think we alluded to it earlier, that when we're talking about these babies, there are babies, right? And that means they are the children of a community. And everyone has a role to play. Um, when, and, and I think it also is really important when, that when we talk about uh, the needs of children, that we not too easily fall into a position where we start wagging our fingers at the parents to the exclusion of everyone's responsibility and what we can do to actually fix the problem. And so I'll give you an example. When we first started the, the, the focus in, when I was DA, we had a case of a, a woman by herself raising her three children, holding down two jobs and homeless, right? Mm. She just needed some help. She was completely overwhelmed. And she didn't know what was available. But because we put this focus on the fact that her children, who, by the way, systemically probably nobody had great expectations of anyway, and we started putting then a focus on noticing that they weren't in school and we actually cared about that, we could then ask the next question, what's going on with mom, then figure out what was going on with her, and then get her access to services that actually exist that she didn't know about. Right? And so I think that that's part of it. One of the other things that, that came up there, we all know it in society. It came up in connection also with a program that we created, which was a reentry program around getting jobs and education to 18 through 24 year old low level offenders, who a lot, of were a lot of whom were parents. Most people have a natural desire to parent their children and parent them well, but not all have the skills to do it. And one of the things that we learned when I was looking at who the partners would be in, in dealing with this is that we really have a dearth of initiatives 
that are about teaching parents how to parent. Like we've got good crisis lines, so we've got the number for the parent to call when they're ready to kill their child. But, <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I don't mean to be over facetious about that, but you understand the point, we're in crisis, parents in crisis. But we don't necessarily have enough that is available with kind of culturally specific, well thought out you know, uh, curricula around teaching parents how to parent their children. And I think we need to do more of that. And, um, but by focusing on the child, then we can ask those parents about the, ask those questions about the parents. You know, I'll just close the comment by making what I think is probably an obvious point for me, which is I think that the best way to, to think systemically about helping a child is in the context of that child's family, if we can. And so it's about not only what we can do for that child directly, but, but for the, the family that is raising that child, whatever that family looks like. Yeah, thank you. That's fantastic. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Harris. My name is Rhonda Harris. And California has one of the highest uh, population of homeless veterans. Yeah. yeah. And I've Very been true. working with homeless veterans mm -hmm. who have That's mental great. challenges. And I want to know what is some of them, most of them actually have criminal records on our inside, mm -hmm. incarcerated. I want to know is your office actually addressing any of the needs? Because many of them are eligible for benefits, which yeah, we try to help right. them with. Mm -hmm. And it can really prove to keep them out of the criminal system if they have their benefits, they're in a program with wraparound services and put them on another path. Yeah. Wondering if your office is doing anything to address those needs. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, and thank you for your focus on that population. Because, you know, when, um, for example, I, in the course of doing the work around the, the foreclosure crisis and looking at vulnerable communities, one was military families who were really targeted, a lot of them, for predatory lending. And, um, and so I think there is a lot more that we can do to honor their service and help them transition back in. Um, we don't, my office does not do direct service providing, so we don't directly provide services, but one of the things that that we did actually early last year is I, realizing that we needed to have more of a focus, sent an email actually out to all the people in my office and encouraged um, those who have military background or, or interest in it to form a, an ad hoc group in my office so we could figure out how we can centralize and make clear the, what we do do for vets and, and also think about how we can enhance our focus for that population since we have so many in California. So um, Travis LeBlanc is somewhere here and, and stand up and smile and wave, Travis. I see you over there. Will you talk to him afterwards? Okay, and let's see what we might be able to do to, to hook up what you're doing. That's okay. fantastic. And, and I would also say that one of the best programs that I reported on um, having to do with veterans was uh, New Directions in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you're in touch with them, but I just think that their model, which yes, is sort of peer-to-peer, veteran-to-veteran drug counseling and rehabilitation is, is wonderful, and I was very impressed with them. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a question. Do we have one from your side, Charles? We'll take one here, and then the last one right here. Uh, hello, DA, or hello, AG, Virginia Marshall. Good <laughs> to see you. <laughs> you too. I was wondering, as our new Attorney General, what do you see as your legacy oh my. when your term ends? <laughs> I hope it'll be a long time in the future. Well, I'm still standing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you worked on so many issues, and I want to always thank you for your support of school district students here in the school district here. And your leadership. Particularly the African American you. students for our honor roll celebration. Yes. And you're always so busy, but what do you like to do to have fun? That's a great, I wanted to ask her that question and you beat me to it, I love it. I love to cook. Um, I just got back, I took a couple of days last week, week before, and went to New Orleans and had the best time, I have to tell you. New Orleans is such a wonderful place and I, you know, I haven't, since Katrina, I've been there a couple of times in an official capacity. In fact, one of those was a couple of years after and they actually took us on a Black Hawk and I looked at the devastation awful, but this, this trip was a pleasure trip. And I just, I ate everything I could put my hands on. Went down to the French market and, and, and just like a good old country woman came out of there with bags of stuff that I brought back. I got some Tazo, you know what that is? It's the, oh yeah, I got, had them freeze it for me. And I've got like this incredible red beans and rice recipe that I'm gonna 
get into this weekend. <laughs> mm, that's great. <laughs> I love to cook, so that's one of the things. I love to be with my family. I love to travel. I just, I, I love life. I mean, it's, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. That's fantastic. And you get the last word. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kamala. Um, so, I hate to be a downer. Okay. But <laughs> uh, as a lawyer working with predatory lending lawsuits, and lots and lots of people lost their homes before you got on the horse and saved the day. Yeah. Is that's there right. any relief that anything we can do to go back and help some of those people yeah. at this point? Well, part of the, um, the national settlement provided for a restitution for those who had already lost their homes, so, so money. Um, but it's not a lot of money. Um, there are, you know, obviously opportunities available through, you know, lawyers like you and services that if they have a real cause of action, they could go and, and, and receive greater compensation for their loss if they can prove damages and harm and wrongdoing. Um, I think another, it, it's, and, and it is, it's awful what happened, there's no question. And, and, and there's also no question that for those folks that we're talking about, we're not going to be able to make them whole. Um, but we should try and get them as close to there as possible. And to that end, I think one of the other issues, you, I'm sure you know, is, um, is helping them clear up their credit. Because so many of them went through that process and then their credit is such that they'll never be able to, to buy another mm. home or even think about it, because they'll just never qualify. So that's one of the other areas. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, in general, this I'll just transition into another area where I think we also just, again, with the idea of not only the California Homeowner Bill of Rights, which is let's never get here again, but the, for the other way to, to also deal with that, in addition, we have got to deal with this issue of financial literacy. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it's so real. It's just so real. We have so many people living in debt. And I, you know, and it's every community. Living in debt because of home loans, these, you know, in terms of the, especially the bubble. Car loans, credit cards. I mean, and there are industries that are frankly profiting off of other people's debt. And, and, and I strongly believe we, you know, and listen, by the way, my staff hates it when I say this. I own my little place in San Francisco. I am the chief elected law officer of the biggest state in the country. I confess to you, I did not read each page I signed in my mortgage. I confess, I did not. And the reality of it is that most people engage in incredibly significant financial transactions buying a home, buying a car, credit card, buy, getting a credit card. And they don't understand what they're negotiating away. They don't understand what to negotiate for. And, and, and it's just simply about empowering people so that when they engage in these contracts, they have some equal footing. And at least they know what they're getting into in the back end. So the financial literacy piece of it is a huge one and, and something we've really got to rededicate ourselves to dealing with. The fine print makes it difficult, but we still, we can't, it doesn't mean that we can't do better also on our end, which is, you know, we gotta, we gotta understand these documents better, which, and I don't mean that it's your responsibility, I mean just in terms of American society, I think we should be teaching this in school. We should be teaching children financial literacy in school as part of the, the, the curriculum, because we expect them, if they're gonna live the American dream, to buy a home. So let's teach, and we're going to expect them to engage in financial transactions as part of being a productive person, right? Yeah, I, I just recently got a, um, a wonderful list of benefits from one of my credit card companies, um, at the bottom of which was buried that they were going to increase another set of fees. So, so beware of the Trojan horses that you get in the mail that right. say you have all these wonderful new benefits, get down to the bottom, and by the way, you know. <laughs> well, and, we're, and we're taught that that's just too burdensome and too complicated and so we'll never understand it so we don't read it at all. And, yeah. and that's part of what we have to deal with too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, in, in our final minutes here, I wanted to take some time to 
um, just allow you to broaden the picture because you've played a role in supporting another pioneering politician in the United States, that is the president, Barack Obama. And, uh, and when, you, when you look at this election season, it's already been so unpredictable on the Republican side. You know, I mean, people, people called the death of the Gingrich and Santorum campaigns a million times before, I mean, you know, Rick Santorum, um, was counted out. He was. He wasn't. I, I, as a journalist, of course, I love watching how images are constructed. And so there'd be like a four to five person panel, and and Santorum would be on one end. They'd never go to him. They'd only keep the focus on two people. Um, but now yeah. that that he and Huntsman, remember? Yeah. Oh they yes, were right, Huntsman. They were at two and, Perry, and then they would all and, yeah, fight. But, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But now that we are, you know, sunsetting the Republican nominating process, we're going to get into some tough and and probably fairly unpleasant general election campaigning. That's right. So w what what That's are right. you as a political insider going to be looking for? as we go through the general election, mm -hmm. either things to look out for or things to look for? Well, for one, I, I was asked to be in, and am a, a, a national co-chair of the campaign to re-elect the President of the United States, Barack Obama. So I will be doing um, whatever is asked of me and whatever I can. Um, to make sure that we elect, re-elect Barack Obama, President of the United States. And, um, and, I, and for many reasons that have everything to do with what I believe is in the best interest of the people of this state. For example, the Affordable Care Act. This president got through, with, with the help, by the way, of, and let's also take some local pride, with the help of Nancy Pelosi, who was an incredible leader on this. Um, you know, pass something that is going to change the future of this country and our children and grandchildren in a way that we can't ever imagine right now. You know, on this issue of, of, of pre-existing health issues, I mean, I went to my dentist and my, my, the woman, the dental hygienist, she's pregnant and, and, and she found out she's pregnant so she wanted to change and improve her, her insurance so she could get prenatal care. Do you know she went to two places and she was denied? And I said, why? She said, pre-existing condition. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> okay? So that's a quick example <laughs> of what I'm talking about. This president did that. You talk about it in terms of what we need to have a, a, a president who is focused on issues that are about improving you know, the United States standing in the world. This president has been committed and effective in doing that. They want to suggest that he is weak. No, he's smart. He's smart. And he makes good decisions, which included doing what Bush and those folks couldn't do for years in terms of dealing with one of the biggest threats to, to, to the United States security. So there are so many reasons. It has everything to do with the fact that this president understands the issue of contraception should not be an issue that is debated as part of politics. It should be the issue that, that, that knowledgeable adults make decisions about in their lives. Um, it, it, there are so many issues at play, not to mention the United States Supreme Court and who will be responsible for making the next series of appointments that invariably will have impact for the next half century, if not century. So there are so many important and good reasons. And um, I do the believe it's going to be close. I think that, um, that Mr. Romney's staff person spoke the truth when he said that there was gonna be an etch-a-sketch moment, right? And that means that the slate will go clean. I mean, how many of you remember what you had for lunch yesterday? much less who was in the Republican primary and what they debated. And you all probably remember all of that, but most people don't because we've been trying to get through our lives on a daily basis. It's going to be a fresh look at these two candidates side by side. And there is going to be a move by Romney to go moderate. And the people who are the, people who are the subject of everyone's desire are independent voters. And, um, and depending on how these these two candidates frame the issues, anything could happen. 
So uh, it's something where I think we all need to, to participate, again, back to the earlier point. You know, this is another way that we all have our voices heard and count. And um, I encourage everyone here, whoever you support, to be active and be involved. When you look at the federal government today, um, so, well, so many of us see this, this not unprecedented, because the country has been divided many times in the past, but this, this high-level division mm -hmm. between the two parties and a lot of gridlock awesome. over what we need to do to solve our problems. Um, in, in your experience in the political world, how do you foster conversation when two sides of an issue have, have lost trust in each other, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. the parties in Washington right now seem mm -hmm. to have, and no one wants to back down? What sorts of strategies can be employed to try to get us out of that mess? Well, a couple of things. I, 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 it's a cliche at this point, it's so obvious and true. There is an incredible amount of partisanship. And um, I think part of what happens is that pendulum is, is gonna have to swing. And we'll see what happens with these congressional races in this next go round and how you know, the constituencies are dealing with the gridlock. And I have to believe that a lot of the folks who are gonna be voting in these elections, especially for the House and Senate, are gonna see that the deadlock is not, and the gridlock is not serving them well. Um, you know, in California, I would suggest also that we really need to re-examine the whole issue of term limits um, on that issue as well, because you know, it's really easy to look across the room at a stranger and say, I'm not listening to you and I don't like you because you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican. It's a whole different thing when that's your seatmate for 10 years and you watch your children grow up together. And life is long, right? And this is an important issue to me this cycle. That's an important issue to you. Let's make compromise. Let's talk. Let's see each other. Um, but right now, I think that something has got to change because it's at a breaking point. And everyone knows it. You know, people certainly within the Beltway in D.C. know it. You can't get anything moved. Nothing can get through. And, um, and I think, you know, like they say, that stuff's going to come home to roost. And the last thing that I will put out to you is, is very much a, you know, a nice fluffy cloud in the sky. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so... 25 years from now, what kind of California and what kind of America would you like to see? Uh -huh. It gets back to the education piece. I would like to see a California where all children graduate from high school with some opportunity to take a path that gives them an employable skill. That's so important. That's a big, big deal. All mm -hmm. children. Yeah. I mean, I'll leave it there. If we could do that, that would be a beautiful fluffy cloud in the sky for me. <laughs> well, you know? yeah, for yeah. me too. Yeah. Well, I, can we get one more round of applause for Attorney General yeah. Kamala Harris? And I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you to Charles Ward. Yay, Charles yeah. Ward. Come, Yerba Buena come back Center up. for the Arts. Yeah. And thank you to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts for bringing us together in community so that we can discuss important issues. And, and again, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. The galleries are still open, so go in and see the exhibit and come back and see us again soon, okay? Thanks. Right. Yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I really that was enjoyed wonderful. it. You were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please, you were wonderful. Oh. This is